Um, so I'll just say something very briefly about the Social Scholar series, and then I'll hand over to uh, Kira to, to do her talk. We usually have about half an hour for um, the speaker, and then another half an hour for questions and discussion. So uh, do try and think of things as, as Kira's going through her talk. Nice. Um, nice things, yeah, yeah. We're not looking for the kind of hostile comments. <laughs> this is a safe space. <laughs> so um, the Social Scholar series started off as a series looking at social media, really, and how scholars can um, be disseminate their research that way. Uh, but we're broadening it out increasingly and um, inviting other interesting and inspiring people to come in and talk about ways that they've been social with research. So everything from curating and exhibitions um, through to uh, policy work and advocacy and consultancy and that sort of thing. Um, the next session that's coming up after this is on May the 17th. And it's uh, same time, same place, I think, as well. And it's going to be Dr. Peter Jones from the IHR talking about a project that he's done working with uh, people in secondary schools, which I think is very, very brave, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Kira Bakrovic from Queen Mary. Um, and Kira is Professor of Children's Literature and Childhood Culture and Director of the Centre of Childhood Culture? Mm, childhood Cultures. Cultures. Uh, which is in collaboration with the b &A Museum of Childhood. And Kira's going to be talking about her experience turning her research into an exhibition and the Alice look. Okay. Thanks, Michael. And thank you all for um, you know, coming during your lunch hour. It's very valuable. Um, there's lots of pictures, as promised. So um, hopefully that will ease the pain. Do you want um, us to close the door or slightly? Um, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, so over the last five years, I've been trying to understand the first phase of the journey from this uh, John Taylor illustration to this Annie Leibovitz photograph. <laughs> Drawing on a number of archives and collections, I've been exploring the different ways in which Alice was dressed in the 19th century, in the books themselves, and in a wide array of related articles produced in the period. I've also been tracing when, why, and in what circumstances people, young and old, all around the world began dressing as Alice, like Natalia Vodanova here. I'm um, <clears throat> currently finishing a book due out with Bloomsbury at some point soon. Um, the books the principal academic output um, of the HRC funded um, research, but I've also produced more public facing output, both within the main project and as various kind of sub subsidiary ventures and prequels. So there was um, the uh, six month exhibition at the Museum of Childhood, which I'll be talking about today. Um, but also a fabric collection with Liberty initiated by Carol's Diaries um, and using the magnificent Liberty archive and uh, a concert suite with the London Symphony Orchestra premiered at the Barbican in 2015, which took historic music sheets held in the British Library as its point of departure. So this is um, the associated teacher training day, so we also ventured into the scary world of teachers and <laughs> although I suppose it wasn't the kids themselves it was just the teachers so it was kind of yeah, not quite as terrifying this is at St Luke's um, and then this was the performance in the Balkan but today I'm going to focus as I said on the Alice Look exhibition I'm not aiming to provide a comprehensive guide this lunchtime on curating an exhibition for academics there's a really good one um, here um, or even, important though it is, how to curate material on children's literature or using childhood culture. Instead, what I want to look at specifically is the process of translating research um, using often specialised and inaccessible collections into something accessible to the wider public in the public arena. So that's the sort of particularity of this, I guess, but there's also some very uh, general uh, observations too. 
So I want to consider the way that collections and archives shape what research can be undertaken and then which stories can be shown. I'm going to be thinking about questions of value, of sensitive issues, uh, and of challenges, compromises, and their resolutions. All exhibits, oh, sorry, all exhibits I now know have their behind their scenes sagas and what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of like the secret history of the Alice Look. Um, I'm not sure where you all are with sort of um, planned exhibitions or maybe you're right in the middle of the process at the moment, um, but I'm certainly very happy to talk more about more practical issues um, in the, in the Q&A later. But I said um, that the materials I've been working with are inaccessible, but that seems slightly counterintuitive in the sense that the Alice books are, after all, staggeringly widely available, and always have been. And the internet is a wash of Alice-inspired photo shoots, garments, and wedding processions. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but my core research is actually concerned with the 19th century, and what's valuable to me, concerned as I am with Alice's visual identity, hasn't generally uh, been deemed valuable and thus collected by public institutions, at least in the United Kingdom. Much precious material has been completely lost. There's no extant fancy dress costumes and no theatrical costumes from the period. Similarly, I know about loads of things um, like wallpaper and exhibited paintings um, which have completely um, disappeared. But thankfully, a great deal of relevant material indeed I now think possibly too much, um, does survive, like these photographs um, of amateur performances, this is from the North London Collegiate School, um, and this from uh, Mount Stuart on the Isle of Bude, um, and this hand-painted tile. Um, stuff does survive then, scattered piecemeal across multiple archives and collections, from deepest, darkest Guildford to the Isle of Bute. But the kinds of visual, often ephemeral material with which I'm frequently concerned, private collections have, for me, been absolutely fundamental. Materials such as these coffee cards, uh, this envelope, which is great, uh, and this um, American edition are all in the hands of private collectors and dealers, and all, more specifically, uh, in North America. My project was only possible because of the generosity of carol collectors and, and sort of, I mean, any cat collector, let alone a carol collector, I hadn't had any encounters with that sort of breed in the past. Um, uh, so it was, it was quite a steep learning curve, but they were incredibly generous and opened up to me not only their collections, but in um, many instances also their homes. So private collections also proved of critical importance uh, in the mounting of the Alice Look. It ran from May to November of 2015 and coincided with the 150th anniversary of the first publication of uh, Wonderland. It wasn't that massive, as you can see, but it was big enough for a first exhibition particularly. Um, and actually that was quite, the whole question of scale we could possibly talk about later because I think certainly um, the museum were very conscious of audience expectation and the audience was very ex expectant of what this exhibition would be as well and it could have been a lot bigger than it was. Um, so yeah, we can maybe talk about scale later on. What it did do uh, was bring together garments, photographs, rare editions, visuals and a very short film, it turned out to be very short, um, to show Alice as both a follower of fashion and a trendsetter. Of a total of 41 objects displayed, only three actually came from the Museum of Childhood's own collection, and only five from the wider V&A collection. And this is in and of itself an object lesson, ha ha, in the importance of looking beyond the obvious. So just as children's voices and childhood agency are instantly being recognised, decipherable from sort of adult archives, so too were relevant materials for this exhibition, not only sort of in the obvious places like the Renier um, collection of children's books and the textile department, but also um, in places like the East Asia department, as we'll see later on. So unlike the main research, which focuses on the 19th century, 
The exhibition covered the full 150 years since publication. Focusing on Alice and none of the other characters in relation to dress is already fairly niche, leaving aside, as it does, many of the other things for which the books are known and loved. Limiting the exhibition to the 19th century would have made it even more so. And interestingly, it was whilst talking through my exhibition proposal with a punter in the form of my museum visiting uh, father of two brother that this became apparent. Um, and that was a decision, um, I might add, that was strongly endorsed by one of the AHRC um, reviewers. So it wasn't just my brother who thought that this was a good idea. Opening up the time span um, also had the advantage of being able to show a wider range of materials of different types, so 3 as well as 2D moving image as well as stills. So the aim of the exhibition as opposed to the monograph, was not then to excavate the Victorian Alice, which is kind of what I'm trying to do in the book, um, but to give a broader overview of how the character has influenced and been influenced by changing styles of dress in Britain and abroad. Opening up the exhibition in this way meant that, in theory, a much wider range of public archives could have been drawn on, yet in practice, private collections, and that of Mark and Catherine Richards in particular, remained absolutely essential to its devising, planning, and delivery. And this photograph of Mark Richards in his front room in Maiden Vale during the um, prep for the exhibition gives an, an idea of why this was the case, why Mark's collection was better than the British Library, a thing which he's incredibly proud of. <laughs> <laughs> so when selecting um, the covers which together most effectively made a point about Alice, that point being that her depiction has often been strongly influenced by prevailing styles of the time of production, um, calling up items 12 at a time from the stacks would have been totally impracticable and wouldn't have given what I really needed, which was a holistic overview. What was needed then and what Mark and Catherine's collection provided was an incredibly precious opportunity to browse open shelves and to lay things out together so that you could get a kind of overview of what they would look like. There's probably kind of technological ways of doing things like that, but I didn't have the time or the skill, um, so this was fantastic. And the Richards uh, would go on to lend some 17 items to the final exhibition, which was by far the link with the largest single source of materials. But what this photograph also makes clear is perhaps the greatest challenge of um, any curation process. Um, in this case, it was the selection of, in the end, just 10 editions from the several hundred candidates inspected. Um, so, you might all be kind of shocked and horrified at this point, um, but uh, yeah, these were the 10 books. So, you know, I'm a literature person mostly, and I only got 10 books in my Alice exhibition. So, you know, oh, shock, horror, um, to some extent. This was further complicated by spatial constraints, um, which meant that any images from within the book had to work extra hard, um, be especially important to justify the extra space required to display them, something I had never considered in the past. So covers are much better than um, illustrations from inside in this respect. In other circumstances, circumstances with more space and or time and or money, there might have been ways around this problem. So, you know, you could digitise more images and use screen display and things. But there's a, also a certain contemporary curatorial practice which emphasises that less is more. Multiple books in cases are regarded as particularly suspects nowadays. And after a recent exhibit at the Grolier Club in New York, which included three volumes of a doctoral thesis stacked up on top of each other. That was in an in exhibition case. I kind of take the point. In any case, how many books does it actually take to make the point that Alice changed over time in line with contemporary fashion? One per decade might actually suffice, um, making the point in the most cogent way. And given that I knew from my research nothing particularly drastic happened until the 1880s, 10 out of a possible 14 perhaps isn't quite as bad as it might seem. 
communicating clear messages um, in this way, the way I've just been describing, is what curation is all about, I now think. In the Alice look, there were just four. So firstly, it was important to get back to basics, to show Alice right at the beginning of her career in the hands of Carol, Tenniel, and later Disney. That was a nightmare. Um, and to show how important dress was to her visual identity from the very beginning. So Victorian dress and accessories that's not very good, is it? Um, were used to demonstrate how typical Alice was when she first emerged into the public sphere. Secondly, um, we used, as I've just been talking about, illustrated editions to show how Alice had been kept relevant and up to date for contemporary audiences um, over the last century and a half. Uh, thirdly, uh, You'll note the very large gap in the middle of that uh, wall as well. I'll mention that again later. Um, thirdly, in the larger section of the exhibition, magazines, photographs, posters and fabrics, as well as a compilation of films and still shots, illustrated the immense influence which Alice has had on different aspects of the fashion industry um, and how she continues to be a reference point for designers, photographers and stylists. We showed a range of people um, dressing as Alice, from Hollywood sirens to ordinary people in their everyday lives. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to this Better Living um, cover, because I'm going to come back to that as well later on. Um, having presented Alice's variation over time, um, a key message in the fourth section was her adaptation through space. Costume, international editions, uh, and visuals brought visitors into contact with strikingly different Alices to either those they already knew uh, or had just acquainted themselves with um, in the earlier part of the exhibit. So those were some... Um, oh, there were a few more books, actually, I've forgotten about those books. So there were a few more books, including the Swahili Alice, um, and then this, the Lita Alice. Overall, the aim was to both historicise and defamiliarise a central figure in the British cultural landscape. Clarity of message can be uncomfortable for researchers trained in nuance and balance, but it can also help in the seemingly endless decisions and choices that curation involves. For instance, of all the countless editions of Wonderland available to us, we decided to include one from the Renier collection which, as part of the V&A, incurred no loan costs. Because it was going to be included in the beginnings section, so uh, there's the, the dress, the, the costume, and then we had um, two editions from the, the Wonderland and the Looking Glass uh, down below. Because it was going to be included here, um, where we were sort of showing the Victorian Alice's, we opted for the oldest copy in the collection, but in that particular 1866 edition, the illustration selected for display <coughs> contained an unexpected surprise in that it had at some unknown point um, been coloured in. <laughs> Which is fantastic, obviously. Um, fascinating evidence of readerly engagement with the text and of um, variations in Alice's visual identity. Was the red fundamental to the colourer's understanding of character? or really the only or best shade at hand. Um, even in the monograph, though, these kinds of things, and they're relatively common, are only of limited use due to a lack of precise data, and we don't know when they get coloured in, so it's difficult to make arguments about them, really. And in the exhibition context, they at best need explanation, and at worst, confuse. And you'll see that from this early one, so I mean, you can't say it, but we didn't use this one. Um, clearly then, um, monetary value, age, and usefulness in an exhibition context don't line up neatly. In the end, we chose another slightly later edition for the exhibition, and I talked about this kind of stuff in the book, and lots of other amateur interventions and reinventions of Alice, too. Display um, both implies and confers value and importance. <coughs> so by putting something in a, in a case or by having it in 
um, the National Museum of Childhood, it kind of does something, says something about the object. It should offer something, I think, more and something different to merely reading about the same subjects and sources, and that goes for sort of online exhibitions too. Um, in the case of the Alice look, as in research more broadly, value didn't in any way correlate to costliness. One of the most frequently Instagrammed items, for instance, uh, was a pair of vans released in the same year and on sale for forty nine ninety nine. And most of what we displayed wasn't worth all that much in financial terms. Although rare, the 17 items lent by Mark and Catherine Richards had an estimated combined value of just £600 or less. And just a quick parenthesis here. Um, through interactions with collectors, I've become acutely aware of the commercial dimension of collecting and, and of the literary objects that I've always worked with. Aware, but not, I'd say, affected by that. Um, in a world where an Alice edition can reach $1.8 million and go unsold because they wanted more, um, little of particular monetary value was presented in an exhibition delivered on what, in museum terms, was a shoestring budget under £14,000. Perhaps there's something particularly to be said for academics, either blissfully aware, blissfully unaware of, or just not very interested in, the commercial value of their objects of study getting involved in curation. End of parenthesis. <laughs> so, um, exhibits then I think should give something more than reading. Um, and we did include some original artwork, um, down the side, you can't see it that well, um, in the form of preparatory drawings for one of the Liberty fabrics, which answered that need to deliver something only available in an exhibition context, i.e. an encounter with something unique, usually hidden, um, and produced by hand, and which I also thought I'd lost at one point um, in the process, which was quite terrifying. But out of necessity or design, we did frequently include reproductions rather than originals. It was completely out of the question to include Carol's original manuscript uh, of uh, Alice's Adventures Underground. Besides the fact that it was on loan to uh, the United States, it would also be completely outside of our very slender budget. Um, but arguably, the point that was being made um, through the manuscript image concerning the evolution of the sort of original Alice's, so the Carol and Tenniel ones, um, was actually better made using a reproduction as it focused in on kind of the essentials, on the point that was being made, rather than having all the rest of the text kind of distracting from it. So you actually got to zoom in on those four figures, which then, I hope, I think, probably made it a clearer point than having four books there with all other stuff going on. So it's almost like you're sort of shining a, a, a sort of spotlight on a particular aspect. Or you could just say, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, it depends on whether you want to make a virtue out of a, out of a complete impossibility, I suppose. Um, less justifiable on intellectual or curatorial grounds, and purely down to budget, was the quite late decision not to include a large section uh, of fabric designed by Voicy which was um, for Liberty in the 1930s. Um, this fabric had been reworked for the Liberty collection and featured on those bands. Um, due to its scale, it was a really big piece of fabric, um, but actually furnishing fabric, so that helped in the ultimate justification of not including it. But um, it would have made a really amazing impact, I think. Um, but even though it was held by the V&A, and so it wouldn't have cost us anything, um, the cost of producing a pre, uh, sorry, a purpose-built frame, which wouldn't survive the exhibition, which would just have been, you know, destroyed afterwards, meant that we couldn't include it. It was beyond the budget. So that was why there was that huge, great hole <laughs> um, on the wall. Uh, because that was where the fabric was going to go. So, you know, last-minute decisions have really major um, sort of implications in terms of um, design. Um, 
Another compromise was uh, the pinafore. Mm -hmm. I scoured the length and breadth of Britain to find a suitable garment. Uh, it turned out that the best one, because of its similar silhouette uh, to Tenniel's illustrations, which happened to be in the museum's own collection, hooray, couldn't be made to fit over the dress we were displaying, because uh, it was too small, boo. Um, <laughs> various possibilities were discussed, including showing the apron separately, so either behind it or alongside it, uh, but there wasn't enough room in the cabinet and we couldn't get another cabinet, so that had to be shelved. That was a really, really good pinafore. The decision was then to use a prop or to dispense with the pinafore altogether. This was quite hard for me. Um, because the latter is such an integral part of Alice's um, visual identity, it was in the end, and as I say, not without some misgivings on my part, decided to purchase a newly made pinafore, um, which was bought online and was made, I think, in China. <laughs> which itself says quite a lot about the contemporary clothing industry, but that wasn't exactly the point that we were trying to make here. But having rather sheepishly fessed up to the great pinafore cover-up during a tour of the exhibition for members of the Dress and Textile Society, I was comforted by the fact that the curator of the historic royal palaces, no less, um, was utterly unshocked and indeed fully behind this decision. So I think this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, and yeah, everybody seemed to find it. Nobody you know, wrote in and complained. Um, another set of decisions um, that happened behind the scenes um, and discussions related to concerns about certain materials in view of the museum's family audience. The museum team were acutely aware of potential complaints about the subject matter because of the widespread if misplaced connection between Carol and paedophilia. Even if the exhibition was concerned with Alice rather than with Carol, or rather than with her creator. So this was acknowledged in the second part of this um, text panel, uh, but not dwelt upon. Visitors were left to observe and form their own judgment about whether grown-ups dressing as a little girl and all children being sexualized uh, is acceptable or appropriate. But the concerns didn't in the end unduly affect what went into the display. On the contrary, admittedly, the museum's director was asked to um, adjudicate, uh, make a judgment on whether or not we could show this double page spread from GQ. Um, the potentially offensive detail, can anybody guess? Mm -hmm. It's kind of... I haven't even seen it though. This is the, so it was, it was the fact that you could sort of see her nipples. Um, had totally passed me by. And that in itself, I think, is kind of interesting in terms of the way that we see things that in different sort of sectors uh, and what we're looking for. Happily, I think the decision was made to include this spread. Um, what's more, they also went ahead um, with this visual by Trevor Brown, which shows Alice's underwear and which is part of a really incredibly sexualized and quite graphic and sometimes grotesque set of images. Even the artist, uh, so, and this was where it was used. Um, so it, it worked really well in the context. Even the artist was uh, fairly surprised, according to this blog post, that it went in. He said, I was fully expecting my inclusion in this to be cancelled, rejected by some stuffy overseer who always has a lot to say. <laughs> So I'm very pleased, happy my Alice is there as promised in all her panty flashing glory. Um, the exhibition focused on Alice's fashion icon, blah, blah, blah. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and in the event, the only objection to this or any other part of the Alice look was on the Telegraph's write up um, of the exhibition, which used Brown's image in, as, an, as an illustration um, and which may say something, I think about um, the importance of surrounding materials to contextualise, because if you only see uh, this, and if, I suppose also if you know the rest of the book, then you might think, what on earth are they doing? But if you see that, 
then maybe that's not quite as bad, at least I don't think it is. Um, okay. In addition to the four main sections of the exhibition corresponding to the four key messages that I've outlined, there were two other parts of the Alice look. The first was this um, show-stopping dress, um, which was a collaboration between um, myself and couture pattern cutter Josie Smith, um, and which I hope delivered that kind of wow factor, that tingle which can only be experienced in a direct encounter. It certainly got a lot of love on social media. Um, Josie and I used Tenniel's um, illustrations and Victorian garments to reconstruct the Wonderland dress. Art historian Frankie Morris had claimed that Tenniel's images are so precise that a pattern cutter could make a dress from them. Um, and this turned out to be completely untrue in the event. <laughs> Alice's abundant mane means that you can't ever see the fuss leaves behind. There's no way of seeing sort of what the pinafore looks like at the back um, and sort of how all of this works. And the, you know, so, you know, how, what's going on behind her hair, we don't know. So she, uh, Josie used Victorian costume to sort of fill that in. Um, by printing Carol's text and um, uh, Tenniel's images onto the fabric, the end result uh, was effectively the dress of the book. Another key feature of the exhibition was a fairly simple, very simple in fact, um, but I, I think quite effective interactive that enabled visitors <coughs> of all ages and genders to create and display their own Alice look. Um, these are some of the um, hundreds, if not thousands, of designs produced. And, and be wary of these kind of things, because now I have all of those, and I don't really know what to do with them. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's kind of follow-on funding kind of opportunities and stuff. But, you know, sometimes we have their ages, but, you know, it's very difficult. Anyway, they are, they are a great resource. Um, and the decision to, the, the museum was very keen on the interactive being a dress up thing because dressing up is really popular, they do it for lots of their exhibitions, they have a person who makes dress up garments which are really resilient because that's what they need to be to last for six months. Um, but I was really resistant to that for two reasons. First of all, um, I kind of thought that having made that dress, we'd sort of done that we've kind of covered that ground already and I didn't sort of want that to be repeated but the key reason was because I wanted to open it up more broadly to boys and I didn't think that a dress up um, kind of activity would be particularly conducive to that. In the end um, what we did having the, um, the postcards meant that it wasn't just gender inclusive but also age inclusive and Lots and lots of people um, did actually get involved with this, and that was great. Um, and I should just say, before I finish, I'm nearly finished, that um, it is really, really easy to forget about a child audience, even when you're working on Alice in the Museum of Childhood. So you know that better housekeeping cover that I alerted you to earlier? That kind of almost didn't go in because there were so many fantastic kind of fashion cover images and um, um, photo features that we could have put in. I mean, it was only because I was in the process of writing a poster for a public engagement um, conference that was kind of talking up all the kind of, you know, oh, this, this, this exhibition is not just for adults, it's also for children. And then I was thinking, oh, <laughs> Oh, children, God, and it's really easy to sort of forget that. And then I realised that there were actually very few children in the objects that we were showing. And so that was kind of, so it was only that kind of stepping back and thinking about what we were doing um, that enabled that to happen. So it was a bit of a last minute thing. Okay, so uh, my final few comments then. Um, as with all forms of translation, there were casualties and compromises involved. Uh, in the Alice look. But as David Damrosch argues in the context of world literature, much is gained as well as lost in translation. In terms of my own 
career development, the benefits have been huge. The exhibition diversified the, muse the museum's audience. Um, it was very popular with 20-somethings, which is not a kind of demographic that they get that much, um, and offered a new way into their collections. Ultimately, the value of the exhibition was allowing people to see Alice afresh, and we see Alice a lot, so that, I think, was not insignificant. Most importantly, and most frequently commented upon in audience evaluation, um, it demonstrated Alice's diversity and circulation across the globe, unfettered by national, national borders. In the light of recent events, and of the worrying rise in racial intolerance and violence in this country, this might actually be the true value of the Alice Book. <laughs>